some of the things we talked about yesterday. I may not do that. I'm just going to uh, sort of let the Lord be in terms of where he wants us to go with a couple of more things that I want to build out. So this may not be particularly orthodox. So we'll just see how it goes. Glory be to God. All right. Hey, uh, we've been in the series called The Supernatural. And uh, we've been talking about as recently as yesterday the context of crisis. The context of crisis. Now, concerning crisis, over in Psalms, the 23rd chapter, David is writing, is writing this, uh, or it gets published, let's say that. After he has gone through what he's writing about. Okay, now, uh, I have reason to believe that David uh, was writing these things, particularly um, when. How's my microphone? Is it on? Did I turn it on? Uh, I have reason to believe that he was writing this. Um, while he was in the process of going through these things. Uh, in other words, <clears throat> particularly when he was, after he was anointed, is when I think David was really writing this, okay? Um, now, that gives us a couple of different time frames to consider. Uh, because we know this was uh, written, we estimate, somewhere around 1000 B.C., okay? And David talked about the fact that he was completely aware of the fact that he had two things. Number one, that he had a covenant, okay? And number two, that he was anointed, now that says to me that this had to have taken place, the things he's writing about, after Samuel, the prophet, came to him and anointed him to be king of Israel. Okay? Now remember that anointing came on David, or the hands were laid on him, and anointing, uh, the anointing ceremony took place privately well before it became public, okay? So the anointing tends to work like that. The kingdom tends to work like that. Working out uh, the kingdom and, and your salvation, if you will, privately, and then it goes public, all right? And uh, David, after he got into... You know, after he got into office, yeah, he had some issues. He had some issues uh, uh, with Bathsheba, so forth and so on. Uh, that affected his ministry, and uh, which, by the grace of God, he recovered from. But he also <clears throat> he also faced issues um, in his rise to actually taking the kingdom. Um, because Saul was pursuing him. And that part really sticks out to me because in this 23rd chapter of Psalms, David is talking about what it is to be in a place of distress, what it is to be in a place of extreme danger. Okay? Now, let me say this. Uh, let's go over to the 23rd chapter. Let's start over here. At verse 6, uh, we want to pick back up here, okay? Actually, let's go to verse 3. Let's pick up right there. Let's see, Lord, is that where you want it? Let's try that. Let's try at verse 3 here. Now, look what he says right here. Uh, nope, let's go back even further. Let's go back to verse 2. Here we are. Now watch this. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. 
actually hold that. Let's go. Let's go down. We're gonna go back up to that verse. Let's go down here and uh, read verse four again. Now watch this. We're gonna move from here and we're gonna go back up to verse two. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So when I'm in a place where there's trouble, where there's danger, what is he talking about? Or how does this relate to us when we're in a place of spiritual warfare? Okay? Where what is happening concerning our enemy is resulting in distress and danger, whether it's distress or danger, spiritually, uh, soulishly, physically, socially, or financially, right? Now, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, okay? Now, why is he not fearing evil right here? Well, let me say this. Number one, he's not fearing evil because the rest of the verse for thou art with me, okay, and thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now, that word comfort in the Hebrew right here means compassion, okay? That means when I'm going through a crisis or a crisis-like situation, that the tendency is to think that the Lord is not with me or that the Lord is not concerned about what I'm going through, but he is concerned. Yes. And his compassion always motivates him to step in and offer any assistance he can. Now, I preface that statement by saying any assistance he can, because everything we're talking about right now, or what we're about to dig into here, is a legal matter okay it's a legal matter now let me say this understanding that this is a legal matter is easier said than accepted all right but it won't get accepted or executed if you don't say it glory be to god now i'm telling you it may it sounds good when it's preached but actually walking through this and dealing with this and staying on the word while you're under this or going through this is a total different matter. Does that make sense? Woo-wee. Glory be to God. Have mercy. Now, watch verse 2. Let me point this out. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Now, in the context of the places David would have been in, particularly when he was out in the wilderness, essentially, or in the mountains where he was fleeing from Saul and his men trying to kill him and so forth and so on, and temporarily during the time that his throne would have been abandoned because of the problems between him and and his son Absalom trying to take over the kingdom from him, the places, uh, uh, geographically speaking, that he would have been in wouldn't have been places where there was just these big, beautiful, grassy, green areas, okay? You wouldn't have seen, uh, it wouldn't have been like uh, uh, fields and fields of grass and and waters everywhere. As a matter of fact, it would have looked more like a desert kind of place, in which case you would have run into pastures or patches of green grass uh, incrementally, if that makes sense. Yes. So you would go through, there would be uh, a barren sort of land where there was no grass. Now, even in the context of sheep right here, uh, where a shepherd is concerned, the sheep need their shepherd to lead them to places of vegetation, and they get that vegetation, vegetation there, and then they go to the next place where it's time to graze. But in the meantime, there is no real place to feed, and in order to get or to stay alive, 
they're going to need to depend on their shepherd to get to that next green place. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, in the context that David is writing here, he's saying that when I am in the valley, all right, when I'm in crisis, then there are going to be my God, whom I have a covenant with, I'm going to need to lean on him because he's going to lead me in the middle of my crisis to temporary places of reprieve. Does that make sense? Now, remember the goal, we don't live in the valley. You see, religion, you live in the valley. You know, you don't never get to come out, glory be to God. You just, you just live there all the time, your whole life is the valley of the shadow of death. No, this is temporary, okay? And that's one thing to remember. Your current crisis is a temporary place, all right? It will not, they used to sing the song, Trouble Don't Last Always. Anybody remember hearing that song? Oh, yeah. It doesn't last always. You hear uh, different parts. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. Things may be uncomfortable temporarily, but there is a brighter day. Does that make sense? Now, also, he has to lead me when I'm in crisis. So when I'm in crisis, I, the, I know there's a desire to just the crisis to be just completely on, over with and gone, but you remember there's a spiritual warfare going on. These are seasons of warfare I'm talking about. The believer can deal with seasons of warfare. And this warfare is not just financially, it can be in multiple ways. It can be concerning healing, it can be in relationships, it can be in marriage. Wherever you are where there is a temporary uh, um, uh, environment of distress, you've got to be open to letting God lead you, watch this, to what to do next. You see what I'm saying? That next green pasture place is not my final place, but it's necessary. I need it next. Does that make sense? Yes, amen. Now, consider this. He also leadeth me beside the still waters. Still waters is contrasted here in comparison with, um, you know, overflowing waterfall, luscious water, you know, just flowing and roaring, you know, in, in that particular case. That's not the kind of water that's right here. Still waters. Now, the word still means refreshing water. Okay? So, he's going to lead you in crisis to times of refreshing. Does that make sense? Time where you, times where you are renewed even in the middle of what you're going through. Now, the reason why I think that's important is because, how can I say this, Lord? That I know that there is a desire for all of us when we're in an uncomfortable season to, to just get out of it. Okay, when I'm, when I'm single, I'm, I'm born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit, I'm living for the Lord, I'm going to church, glory be to God, I'm shouting on a good foot, have mercy, I'm, I'm tithing, I'm sowing seed, I'm confessing, I'm praying in the Spirit, I'm believing God, you, you know, and in the meantime, you know, I'm in a, an uncomfortable place. Uh, because I'm wanting that companionship. I'm wanting to be married, okay? Now, um, I certainly don't want to stay in this state forever where I'm not going to get the relationship and so forth and so on. But in the meantime, I need to be open to God's leading to what keeps me refreshed and renewed in the meantime. Does that make sense? And they can come in all kind of different ways. Sometimes it could be times of fellowship. You see? It could be times of fellowship with, with uh, 
different people within your church family, different people in the body of Christ, certain trips in general that refresh you in the meantime, you know what I mean? So that you get renewed essentially and are able to move on headed towards your ultimate goal. Does that make sense? In other words, I want to be, I need to know that in between, I believe I receive it and manifestation, there is help, there is renewal, there is refreshing, and there is rejuvenation in between there. Does that make sense? Yep. Is that, does that, do, do you get that? Yep. Ah, I'm going to have to keep moving. I'm going to have to go somewhere else. I'm going to have to go somewhere else. Now, let me say this about David. David pulled on his covenant. He applied pressure to his covenant. I'm saying, uh, let me, let me, let me, let me back up. Let me say it like this. Let's go back to verse four really quick. Look at this. Gave her walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. I won't fear. Okay? Now, we talked about that yesterday. Fear does what? Fear has torment. What I fear the most will come on me, right? I won't fear when I'm in a place that's uncomfortable. I won't fear when, and, and you got to think about this. You got to really be real about stuff like this. In your marriage, you know, there are times in marriages where husband and wife, man, are really just not seeing eye to eye, you know, not getting along, you know, and then on top of what I'm dealing with with my spouse, uh, there are uh, other issues over here elsewhere in the family, you know, there are other issues here on my job and things that I'm not particularly happy about over here. And, and over there, you see? Now, when all of these things start to sort of weigh on you, the temptation sometimes is to get in fear, okay? Or watch this, get dismayed. As though, oh my God, I'm never gonna make it out of this. Fear, the expectation of, of bad things. And when that fear starts to take root in your thinking, you start talking it, right? That's right. You start talking it like, and uh, before you know it, your disposition reflects it. You know, Jerry Savelle says that if the enemy can't get your joy, he can't take your stuff. Amen. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Even when you are in the valley right here, you must do things like what David did, you and I. You must encourage yourself in the Lord. Stir yourself up. You see, if you really stay pressed out, pressed and emotionally distraught while you're in the valley, does that not say that you don't expect to come out of the valley? Does that not say that you are, you've grown accustomed to living there, and if that's the case, then you're probably not in faith, probably not operating in faith, expecting to come out of there, right? Uh, let me move from that. I'll get back to that a little later. Now, let me say this. Yeah, look at Now, turn over with me really quick to, let's go to Isaiah. Let's go back over to Isaiah, the 54th chapter. Is this making sense to you so far? Don't worry about it. I'm coming around the corner of your street in just a moment. Don't even worry about it. Damn mercy. I'll be right Wait. over there. Now, in Isaiah 54, again, 
again, we're talking about covenant. But again, I want to point this out about David. David was so, so aware of the fact that he had a covenant with God. He was extremely aware of it. He was so aware of it that he consistently applied pressure to it. That's good. That's good. Now, he did that because he had an understanding to, the, to a degree that a covenant was a legal matter. Are you with me? Yep. A covenant was a contractual matter where God had sworn to fulfill his part. In this thinking, when God swore to do his part, he was constantly in the state of a seven or eight year old kid that's always hitting on mommy's leg or daddy's leg like or waking up every morning mommy daddy you said we were going to a park today you see that basically that's how you got to do it you got to stay on him now you got to make sure you keep his word now mommy daddy you said we were going to disney why because that kid has ultimate confidence as far as they're concerned, what they have been told is law and absolutely going to come to pass. Amen. So naturally, when I've not seen it yet, my recourse is to constantly put pressure in terms of expecting its fulfillment at any moment. Amen. You see that? Yes. So this is David's yes. posture. This is David's posture towards God. Now, the difference between the kid and the parent is after the parent uh, has done this a few times, tell them they, they're going to take them, but then don't take them, which is not a good idea, <laughs> then the kids can sort of lose confidence in the parent. Like, yo, when? You said last, you said last week. And we, we still have it gone. Why do you keep lying to me? Well, David, well, God had never lied to David. He, David had come to grips with the fact that God was a man of his word, that he would keep his word no matter what. In Psalms 138, God is recorded as having said that he exalted his word above all his name. Name meaning authority. And so his word goes first and then his power follows it. You see? Now, David understood that this was the existing, alive, all-powerful God, and he knew that he had a covenant with this God, so he knew that no matter what, he was going to keep his word. So there was never a time with David where he was possibly considering the fact or the possibility that God would not keep his word. You see? Yep. Now, particularly if David is going through this after he was anointed to be king, after Samuel laid hands on him, if you recall prior to this, David is out there taking care of the sheep and bears are trying to kill his sheep. And he's killing these bears himself. Lions are trying to kill his sheep and he's pulling on the covenant he has with God and killing these lions, which is impossible in the natural sense, right? So now by the time that he's being hunted by Saul and his men, he's convinced that God is a man of his word and that covenant works. You see? Now it's at this point he's pulling on that covenant. 
You see, at this point, he saying things that we see here in uh, the 23rd chapter. He's saying things that, listen, doesn't, doesn't matter where I go, the Lord is with me. Amen. You see, yeah. doesn't matter what's happening, he's with me. I'm not by myself. I, he, he, he's com he comforts me even while I am being hunted. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. He leads me to places where me and my men, my army can feed temporarily even while we're being pursued. But we know we're coming out of this. Yeah. God is good to me even in crisis yeah. and he has promised to bring me out. So he's operating at this level of, watch this, faith. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, faith in a time like this is extremely important. Now, I need to prove that. I want you to go over to Romans, the first chapter, uh, verse 17. Uh, let's start at verse 16. Now, this is Paul writing concerning faith. Look what he says here. He says, For I, talking about himself, on I terms, glory be to God. You know, we church people, we need to sometimes keep things on I terms. You know, we got everybody else's terms telling everybody else what they should do. Sometimes this needs to be personal. To you. Does that make sense? Me too. Preaching to myself. Glory be to God. He says, For I am not ashamed. Okay? I am not ashamed. Now, ashamed would be put to shame in the context of how this would have been used back in the society he was living in this embarrassment was indicative of this embarrassment as a result of disappointment yeah. you see I'm embarrassed because I went after something that didn't work yeah. That's wild. does that make sense yes. I have been put I am embarrassed and the feeling of shame is on me, particularly as it relates to my community, because I have gone after something that didn't work. Well, what is it? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Now, for Paul, this is interesting because this man previously was a high-end doctor of the law. He was a Jewish scholar. He would have been the equivalent of the most important group of people to the Jewish um, to the, the Jewish community and he leaves abandons his high class position in leadership and starts to take up the cause of preaching about Jesus being the Messiah and he says having left all of that uh, significance and come over here I am not disappointed, nor have I been put to shame concerning my peers and my community concerning the word because it has worked for me. Now watch this. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. You know, thank you, Holy Ghost. You know, I don't know who I'm saying this. This may be for... Somebody online, I don't know, but you've got to celebrate the success of other people. Amen. Not want to have their success. Yes. Amen. Do you get that? Amen. Yes. I'm telling you, I get that so strong in the spirit. You have to command your flesh to stay out of envy towards other people. You can't look at the success, particularly in ministry, of other people and, and envy it. Does that make sense? Amen, yes. you, can't, you can't be dreaming about seeing yourself having 
their position. Does that make sense? Ooh, I tell you what, that's for somebody. Glory be to God. We've got to celebrate the uniqueness of how God is using other people outside of you. That's right. You see? Yes, sir. Not want to replace them. None of that. You've got to celebrate. Amen. You've got to stay out. You can't be a hater in the kingdom now. Right. No haters in the kingdom. You know, you got to keep them haters far away from you. Go with me to God. They'll sabotage everything. Mess around, have everybody beat up because of their, their, their jealousy that they can't control. All right, I said it, Lord. I'm moving on. I said it. Now, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the anointing. Yeah, you got to celebrate people. God doesn't move you. He doesn't move haters, man, I'm telling you. Haters don't advance in the kingdom. They, they stay right where they are. They never move up, Okay. Now, uh, for I'm not a, sometimes to do in the Baptist church to move you up real quick. Mercy, I'll tell you what. <laughs> no, I don't know. Never mind. Don't pay no attention to that. For I'm not ashamed of the good news of Christ. Christ is the anointing, right? Yoke destroying power. I'm not disappointed concerning the, the good news, watch this, or the word concerning yoke destroying power all right now the bible is the word of yoke destroying power watch this the bible contains the instructions of the covenant okay the bible contains the instructions of or the faith that David received concerning the confidence he had in his covenant with God. You see that? Yes, he found out that the word, which was the Torah in the Old Testament, the first five books of the Bible, that was considered, ladies and gentlemen, the word of God is not a statement that just started to come around after Jesus died and rose from the dead. You understand that, right? The Old Testament, in the Old Testament, they constantly referred to the word of God. They were talking about the Torah. So they had the word to a degree, just like we had the word. What they had, they had to apply faith to it. Same thing for us. Now watch this. For it, Talking about the word is the power of God. What is the power of God? What's the power of God? The word. The word. What does the text say? The gospel. The gospel. The good news. The good news and the word is synonymous, right? It's the power of God. That word power is dunamis, right? The word is the power. Say that with me. The word, the word. Is, is the power. power. The power about what? Watch this. Unto or that produces salvation. Now, what does salvation in your own explanation? What do you what does that mean? What does that say to you? You ever been in Bible studies like that? In church, you ever been in those kind of Bible studies? Or it's like, okay, all right, guys, now, why don't you, we're going to go around every, hey, tell me, what does this scripture mean to you? <laughs> yeah, a lot of this. Next thing you know, you got 20 different explanations, 19 of them are full of unbelief, and everybody walks out confused. No edifying took place. But hey, the people in the... Seats got to give their opinions. That's not what church is for. Did you know that? Ooh, how about talking about that? You know, church isn't, church isn't for. You know, before I got delivered, you have to understand, when I was in the world, when I was on the run, put it that way, from the kingdom, I would go to churches... I would go to churches to visit at times, particularly when like Chelsea would drag me to one and force me to one and so forth. And 
you know, other circumstances, very, very rarely. <laughs> and when I would go to these churches, I would play keys on contract and play for mu play for money at these churches. And uh, every now and then, somebody would trap me and corner me into giving an explanation of God or the word in some kind of way. And usually they would trap me by baiting me with t saying things that were so absolutely ridiculous and so contrary to the word that at times I just couldn't resist but to say something. And you know what would happen when I would say something? I would turn both environments completely upside down. The it would be so big and people would be so uprooted because my explanations typically contradicted everything that they were hearing over the pulpit. And my explanations were generally accurate. But and they would pull on that and want me to talk so much to where the pastors would come out of their pulpits and like, please, you know, talk and expound and tell us this. Now, even as a backslidden preacher, I knew better than that. Did you get that? I knew better than that. I knew that I didn't have any jurisdiction to be speaking in those places, and that's trouble. And so I would, I, I would have to, I understood that I need to keep my mouth shut. And you know what? When you're in another man's house, you're in another church, another group, you don't take over and start spouting your revelation mm -hmm. unless you're invited to do so. Did you get that? Yes, the gospel is not designed for you to wow people. You understand that? Yes, it's not designed to spout off all of your vast knowledge of the Bible. It's not how it works. That anointing works under a particular order. When the Lord has commissioned you and you have been invited to do so, then you do it. Otherwise, you hold your peace until you do. Does that make sense? Yes. Do you get that? Yes. I'm telling you, AWOFC, you got to watch it. Now, I went in a, I was invited as into a Bible college. And uh, telling me about going to this particular Bible college. And they offered, they said, we will give you an honorary degree just for coming to uh, the Bible college. You're free. You don't have to worry about anything. We'll give you the degree. So I said, okay, I went. glory be to God. Now I'm sitting there in the classes, and you know, there's unbelief all flying around all over the place. Every time you turn around, bow, 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 bow. Every comment full of unbelief. The teaching full of unbelief. And uh, because they knew I was a pastor, because they knew I was a pastor, they said, well, Pastor Cooper, since you're actually out in the field right now, since you're already a pastor, tell us, pray tell, what you think. And I was saying, no, I don't want to do that. I don't think that's a good idea, uh, sir, with all due respect. I don't think that's a good idea. Oh, come on, Pastor. Listen, we want, watch this, we want to hear what you have to say. Please minister to us. And then I said, and the Lord said, Al, don't do it. He said, Al, do not do it. He said, this is not your platform. This is not, you don't have any grace right here. Wow. Don't do it. And I said, uh, I would call Chelsea. I believe I'm breaking. I'll be like, babe. They, they're putting the pressure to me, baby. It's, and uh, I would go back, and they, I would resist day after day after day. Well, one day, they asked me, and I have no choice but to let out what's in me. Yeah. 
You know, after you're living by faith, you don't even, it's, it takes effort for you to speak unbelief. You see what I mean? So they asked me a particular question about something, and I responded, and sure enough, you know what happened? Turned the whole class upside down. Glory be to God. So much so, just off of just a couple of comments, that the people in the, in the class were pulling on me. You see? It's pulling on me. Please, speak to me. Minister to me. But what do you think the leaders of those classes were doing? Leader came to me and said, um, Pastor Cooper, um, we've talked and <laughs> we feel like it's maybe the best idea that you don't come back anymore. <laughs> and I said, I completely understand. I love you. God bless you. Wow. And I was gone. Now, I already knew that I did not have any authority. See, I put that on 30 minutes that time. I tricked him. Hey, Marisha, I tricked you. 30 minutes, 35 minutes, what it was, Victor, 35. And uh, I knew I had no authority to be there, so I knew basically no fruit could come of it. You see what I mean? I don't know who that's for again, but that is uh, totally outside of what I'm talking about here. Now, for Christ is the power of God, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, deliverance, wholeness. Okay? Sozo, wholeness, deliverance in whatever area it's needed. Deliverance from crisis. Watch this. Unto everyone that believeth. Now watch this. The word of God results in deliverance from crisis. Watch this. Only when faith is applied to it. Did you get that? Woo, you missed your opportunity to run right there. I'm telling you that David experienced the word of God that he knew in the five fir the first five books of the Bible known as the Torah, which contained the information concerning, guess what? The blessing. What covenant was David pulling on? The blessing Abrahamic covenant. The, co the, co the Abrahamic covenant is what David was operating under. Do you see that? Yeah. Blessed shalt thou be in the city. Blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed when you come. Blessed when you come. You hear we sing it here all the time. Did you know that's where we got that song from? That's, that's where it comes from, right? And he's pulling on this covenant the whole time. He is constantly in remembrance or reminding himself, keeping himself stirred up and reminded about the fact that the covenant that he has with God through Abraham covers him in absolutely every area of life. And he kept pulling on it, applying pressure to it so much that it started to turn into manifestation. You see that? Do you get that? Did that sound churchy? Do you, do you not see that? Oh, Lord, have mercy. Out in there, have mercy. Watch this. Turn over with me really quick to Romans 10 chapter. Now, I want to point this out. This is always good to be reminded of. Verse 1, for me too. Paul says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Not just saved from sin, but whole. Okay? Oh, yeah. Saved in terms of salvation, made whole, delivered as a nation and individually walking in the blessing. That's available for them, right? right. He says, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. 
Now I want to read that in the New Living Translation. He says, I know what enthusiasm they have for God, but it is misdirected zeal. Did you get that? <clears throat> for they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself. Refusing to accept God's way, they cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. Did you get that? Yeah. Now, back to King James right here for the next verse. I'm going to read that in King James. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. What does righteousness mean? God's right way of doing things. God's idea of being right and his right way of doing things, right? And going about to establish their own idea of being right and his right way of doing things. Now, the emphasis right here I'm talking about tonight is concerning God's right way of doing things and how important it is. It's a matter of law. As a result, they have not submitted themselves unto God's right way of doing things. Now watch this. Verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who? That believeth. Now let me read that in the Living Translation. Stay with me right here. Don't zone out. You'll get it. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. So being made right with God is a matter of believing. Okay? Now watch this. For Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of its commands. Now watch this. Under the law results the emphasis on results was keeping every single law to the letter yeah. as opposed to believing what God said. Now, does it mean that what God said and his laws were not important? Paul said, well, is the law sin? He said, God forbid. I would not have known truth or what's right had it not been for the law. But here's the thing. They discounted the fact that they could never really truly understand what to do and actually do it without believing God first. You see that? It required a confidence in the character of God in, in that covenant to actually carry out and do those things. With our children, we're, we're trying to get their obedience through their heart, not just with the belt. Do you see that? Fear will only keep you doing what needs to be done for so long. So what these people were trying to do is trying to obtain results from God without paying attention to believing him and getting his heart. Because you get his heart through faith. Do you get that? You, you don't get it yet. You don't get it. You, you just you got razzle dazzle right there. Let me say it from over here. Let me say it from this direction where my angels and so forth are. I'm saying that in order to keep God's laws, you need an impartation of his heart. That's right. yes. You need an understanding of his character. That's right. yep. You need to trust him. That's right. Trying to keep his laws without that eventually will cause you to falter yeah. and give up. Now, Moses describes the law, according to this text, that way. That he who only lives by the law and negates faith will get those that sort of result. Does that make sense? Are you with me? Okay. You're, not, you're not lost, are you? If you're lost, raise your hand. It's okay. 
I, I'm gonna, I'll say it different. Are you with me? Now watch this. Look at this. That the man which does those things shall live by them. They, you take yourself out of grace. There's no grace when you live that way. There's no grace when you live by strictly law keeping. This is why you got to forgive yourself when you miss it. If you don't forgive yourself, what you're saying is that the results in your life are based off of your own merit and your own working hard. You're essentially saying that I don't need the assistance of God to get results. You know what that is? It's pride. Self-centeredness. When you have a hard time forgiving yourself, when you miss it, it's pride. You're discounting the fact that your ability to be successful depends on faith in believing what God said. Now watch this. And that's why you'll be so, this will cause you to be moody. This will cause you to be up and down where Christian living is concerned. You'll be on the mountaintop today and tomorrow you'll razzle dazzle. Anytime things aren't going right or not going your way, it's, you, it's, it's rough for you. And it can also make you control. It can place you over into trying to control people, manipulate people, you know, and women, you really have to watch out for this. You have to watch out for manipulating people. We know that women are extremely smart, okay? <laughs> we men know that, <laughs> but you've got to watch um, manipulating your way. Let me tell you a revelation I got from my wife. This just explains so much to me, and I believe she got it from... Drenda Kassou, and uh, talked about that this generation concerning women has is a feminist generation, and the spirit of behind the feminist movement goes back to the Bible, where under the curse, the curse described that the woman's desire would be to her husband, or watch this. Her desire would be to rule over her husband. Yep. Did you get that? Yep. Her desire would be to lead while the husband follows. Now, husband, wives, men, women, wives don't lead your husbands. Men, don't let your wives lead, take your place. Now, wait a minute. There's another side of this because we know oftentimes these men are razzle-dazzle. Glory be to God. <laughs> no, we have a tendency not to be in place, not to step up and do leadership. Well, if you find yourself in a situation like that, woman of God, you've got work to do. But your work is going to need to be done in the spirit, not in the natural. Yes, that is a spiritual dynamic that you can't fix naturally you've got to fix it spiritually you're going to have to do what the word says you're going to have to use your faith so that the disobedient unbelieving spouse even if they're born again changes and becomes obedient and believing does that make sense and you can't do it by manipulating him if you manipulate him you slow the process you're hurting yourself and that family when you take it in your own hands to do it. You've got to put spirit power in this situation. You've got to believe God and you have got to do what the word says do. Your husband not doing what's right does not give you permission to not do the word. Because the word doesn't have anything to do with your husband. It has to do with you. When your husband sees that you are committed to God and his word and are doing that word, it gets his attention. Yeah. Vice versa, men, you know, women get like this too. Go be able to leave us out, you know. When the wife is not doing right, no matter how many times you tell her, oh, I'll tell you, my wife uh, now is, she's on time for things now. You know what I mean? Now, there was a time where... My wife was just never on time, glory be to God, and it just, 
I mean, it just ran straight through me. You know, it's, when it comes to not being on time, you can be late every now and then, but it's all the time, every appointment, that, that's a problem. You know, none of us should be there, male or female, right? That's not, you can't manage time, you can't manage money, you can't manage nothing else, right? And uh, it's not cute to be late all the time. You're, you're, you're getting over into lying is what you're doing. Keep your word. If you say you're going to be somewhere, be somewhere on time, right? Be responsible like Alethea, glory be to God. Get on time. No. <laughs> so I'm leave you alone. Now, now uh, and it would just bother me to no end. And uh, I'm telling you what, I had big, grandiose speeches and messages prepared. Sometimes I could be planning it. I feel like I would be planning these messages out. For two or three days in advance, glory be to God. Like, yeah, I know this word right here is going to be in it. This is going to do it. And so love, once I give that word, it's like, pew, 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 pew. It's just make things worse. Finally, I had to let it go. I had to stop fussing about it and just believe God. And not fear the consequences of her consistently not being on time for the rest of our life. You see? And you know what that did? What that allowed her to do? It allowed her to have the space to work on what she needed to work on. To hear from God without my pressure. You see what I mean? And it's a process, but it's necessary. Well, women, it's the same thing with your husband. You've got your picture. Listen, women, you don't respect another man more than your husband. You don't have more respect for me as your pastor than you do your own husband. You respect your husband first. Now, does this mean do, if your husband is telling you to do something that's contrary to the word, you are not obligated to do no such a thing. You hear me? He's telling you to do something that's contrary to the word. Why are we even talking about that? That's not even worth discussing. You already understand what the protocol is concerning that. But you're honoring him. You don't have permission to not honor him because he gets ugly. You don't have permission to holler at him and scream at him and berate him or tell him how terrible he is just because he really is terrible. You see, you, the love of God, if it takes off in you, what am I preaching about right now tonight? <laughs> if the love of God is able to flow through you, God can get involved and reach the heart of the person that's problematic. Amen. But as long as you're trying to control things and manipulate things, and you always have in your thinking how things should go, how things are supposed to work, you got to let go of that. You got to let go of that. You're not created to control everything. You're not created to, to, you're not created to dictate things. You're created to intuitively trust. You've got to trust God with your spouse. You know, I had to make I had to make a decision like, listen, I don't it doesn't matter if, if Chelsea decides not to do what's right in a particular area. I there is nothing I can do but believe God. Yeah. And guess what? The first 10 days that you go on your knees, it probably won't change. You know what you do? Get down on your knees another 10 days and you stay there, stay consistent. Keep believing God till it changes. Amen. Do you think that good? Okay, I'm almost done, boy. I'm almost done. Can you handle five more minutes of this? Or are you done? It was tight, but it's right, my granny would say. Lord, have mercy. Now, watch this. But the righteousness with this earth full. What are we talking about now? The righteousness, what does that mean? God's right way of doing things, contrast here, righteousness by the law, emphasizing their works, leaving out faith, as opposed to the righteousness which is of faith. Two different things. Well, what about it? Speaketh on this wise. 
Watch. Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. Here's where, here's where the rubber meets the road. Verse 8. But what saith it? Or how does the righteousness or God's right way of doing things concerning faith work? Do you see that? How does it work? By the word. You see that? That covenant pressure is applied to the covenant starting with David believing what God already said. You see that? Now watch this. When you believe what God says, when you apply faith to what he's already said concerning your covenant, his desire to do good to you, to bring you out of crisis, to meet your needs, everything that the blessing of Abraham covers, to, to, to not withhold anything good from you, not to withhold a wife from you, not to withhold a husband from you, not to withhold healing from you, right? You've been blessed in every area. Consider this. It begins to work in your mouth. Does anybody ever notice when you're in a crisis situation, in whatever way, family, marriage, finances, whatever, do you ever notice how hard it is to speak the word when you're really in? I'm not talking about when you're in a for play crisis. I mean when you're in a real crisis. Has anybody ever experienced this but me? When you're in a real crisis, you will find it difficult. When everybody around you get married and you're not married, it can be difficult to say, thank you, Lord, that the man who findeth the wife has found a good thing. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord, that the woman that findeth the husband findeth a good thing, that I'm a virtuous woman for my husband, that I meet to serve with my spouse, whatever the case may be. It can be difficult, or sometimes you may get off the other way. So every time you see somebody get married, uh, you start to confess it like crazy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that my man and man and father and wife find a good thing. Man and father and wife find a good thing. Man and father and wife find a good thing. Man and father and husband find a good thing. Glory be to God, working for me right now. I have it. I have it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You see that? Now you get to confess it out of fear. Or when you're going through healing, when you're receiving your healing, to when you feel the pain in your body, the last thing you want to say at times is by Jesus stripes I'm healed and it hurts just to even move your mouth you know what crisis tries to do Shut you up. paralyze you yeah. freeze you yeah. finances when all the bills are due <laughs> Woo I'm telling you what everything is due and there's no way to pay it freeze Panic! If you saw, if anybody looked at the the storyline on the Facebook, you should see that Chelsea does an amazing job posting those those different things. That's a ministry in and of itself, and she's highlighting about what to do in crisis, not meditating on anxiousness today so that your tomorrow works the way it's supposed to. Why? Because you get over in fear and anxiousness today, you're going to freeze. And you're not going to be doing what needs to be done so that you can actually walk into your tomorrow. You see? You're going to stop everything. You stop praying. Has anybody ever experienced that? Have you ever been in, since you've been living by faith, have you ever found yourself in a season or at a time to where things are so problematic in a particular area that you, it's difficult to pray? You're not alone. Ain't no use you being ashamed of it. Glory be to God. It is what it is. It happens. You're not a... We're all... It happens to the best of us. You know, Andrew Womack, who now is probably one of the top five ministries in the world right now, said that he got to a point in his ministry. First of 
Bar said, every day, or for a long time, for years, there was never more than four people in his, in his, uh, in his church or Bible studies. Never more than four people. And uh, they just got extremely used to that. And uh, he got to a point to where things got so hard. Ooh, this ministers to me, Sister Chelsea. Yeah, mercy. Where things got so rough, and, they got, and it was so much pressure to where he was just like, I'm done. Like, I can't do this. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. That I can't do this, that I can't go forward. You know how he came out of that? The people around him got him out of it. Amen. People around him encouraged him to get him out. Amen. Now think about it. What credit is, to the, is that to a mighty man of God? He didn't come out just on his own. The people around him, you know what they did? Reminded him of everything he had preached Praise to God. them. Wow, yes. that's right. That's he said, no, man of God, this word, I'm paraphrasing. No, man of God, this word is going to work for you. Glory be to God. It, what the word says, we will have it. It's going to work for you. Absolutely. Pulled him right out of that thing, glory be to God. He said one day, he came to church. It just seemed like it happened overnight. And it went from four people to a uh, family. Some church closed down. And next thing you know, all of the people in that church came and joined his church. His ministry. <laughs> like overnight. Chelsea and I used to be encouraged by that. Glory be to God. We have to remind, you know, when you pass a church, you got to remind yourself of every testimony Amen. that the men and women of God who have been successful before you have overcome. You know, you have, you really have to remember um, um, Gary Cassie, and I'm paraphrasing too, uh, talked about that, um, you know, obviously as a pastor, and as a business owner and so forth, that in that ministry, it got to the point to where uh, they just wanted to quit so many times. Wanted to quit their company so many times, just give up the ministry to where it literally would bring them to tears. He had uh, made up his mind that he was going to resign and decided to go to one last conference. I believe his wife talked him into going to and uh, went to the conference, had already written, I believe, his resignation letter and so forth. And um, when he got to the conference, uh, Dean Radke, I believe it was, the anointing that was operating on Dean Radke was so strong that it turned everything around in his life. And he decided not to quit, not to give up. You see what I mean? See, faith will allow room for you to make adjustments. You see, David at times, man, he missed it. He missed it while he was out there. He certainly was not a perfect man, but when faith is operating, you can get right back in the right place quicker than you ever dreamed possible. Yes. Do you see that? Yeah. All right, I'm, let me finish this up. I've been up here a long time. Lord have mercy. The word is nigh thee. It's even in thy mouth. And in thy heart, what is that? The word of faith, or the word that has faith in it. That word contains the covenant. The knowledge of the covenant gives you the strength to apply pressure to what God has promised you already. It will take you through a crisis. Does that make sense? It will take you through a situation that you can't fix on your own. Often by telling you what to do next. Green pastures, still waters, in the middle of the desert. Hey, this is the next place we need to get to right now. This is where we need to be. And then this is where we go next. And you keep going one step at a time. Uh -huh. Piece by piece, because you're in faith and grace, let any man, any man who lacketh wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and does what? Uh, does not hold it back. He does, well, doesn't hold it back. What else does that word upbraid mean? It means not to accuse. He won't accuse you when you stop and say, Lord, I need help. 
tell me what to do. Did you know it's okay to do that in faith? Do you ever feel like that's not okay to do at a faith church at times? Do you ever wonder, feel like that? Is, is that, where that it's not okay to be like, Lord, I absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, don't know what to do right now. I need your help. What you need to do it with, he said, but let him ask in faith. Yes. Nothing doubting. He said, the man who doubteth, let him not think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Lord, I don't know what to do, but you do. I believe I receive it. I believe I receive your wisdom right now. I have it. Thank you. And Jesus' name is working for me now. Then you know what you start doing? Look for the next green pasture. You see that? How do you do that? Start stirring yourself up like David did. Start talking it. Start talking it. Yes. Start getting bold. Start talking it. Even though it feels crazy. I know. <laughs> Even though it feels like you're lying. Even though it feels like it's pointless. Start talking. Keep talking and speaking that covenant. Jeremiah 1.8 says, or... Uh, not Jeremiah, Joshua 1 8, he says, Let not the book of this law depart out of what? Your mouth. Your mouth. Yeah, Why is he saying don't let it depart? Because pressure is going to be applied yeah. to get it out. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, what happens? The enemy comes to do what? Steal Immediately steal that word. Yeah. You've got to keep saying it no matter what it looks like, no matter how it feels. Yeah. Crisis. Is not your destination. Amen. You are not designed to live there. You'll come out. Amen. You received yes. that? Did you get yes. something out of that? Let's give the Lord a praise for that. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I tell you, faith people should always have a praise. Glory be to God. We should always have a praise. We should always have a, 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 a crazy uh, brother church scream. Hallelujah. We should always have it. Glory be to God. Never allow yourself to get comfortable without having a praise. Otherwise, you turn into a regular church person. You hear me? Glory be to God. All right. We're going to uh, worship the Lord concerning our giving as we praise out. We're going to continue to receive our offering and worship the Lord. I'm going to point out something really quick that the Lord recently uh, made it known to my wife and I. Uh, adjustments we needed to make concerning naming our seeds. And uh, it was an adjustment that we didn't think uh, was really as big as it really is because the way particularly with us the way we sow is we have our tithe and then we have partnerships okay and where our tithe is concerned we our time of worshiping where our tithe and, and offering and so forth is concerned is just like you guys here at the church every sunday and every monday when we confess concerning our tithe and so forth we even me for my own home that is for my own life and my own home as well. But outside of that, we have seed, obviously, that we sow. You don't want to just stay with your, your tithe. Uh, you want to sow above. That's where your increase comes from. Yeah. You get into the habit of just, you're so used to just sowing and giving that you never take the time to name those seeds. And we uh, were reminded of a man of God who had started to learn how to sow seed. When it came to his seed, uh, he had started to uh, name it, and then he got to one that he didn't name. And when he didn't name it, the harvest he got was the harvest he got was the same was uh, not the harvest he was expecting. Okay, a valuable lesson from the Lord. And that lesson was that I need to name every seed. So if you're going to sow a seed, you need to name it, down, and you need to claim it. You need to say and write down what you are expecting to receive back. 
Don't be passive about it. Don't be lazy about it. Amen. Write down your seed so intentionally on purpose and name what you are expecting to receive. Amen? Yes. Does that make sense? Yes, that's great. Right, let's worship the Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are our very own Father, and we are your very own children. And we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. There's an anointing right there. We thank you, Lord, that you've brought us out of a place of lack, placed us in a land that is overflowing in milk and honey and phenomenal provision increase where we go higher and we don't go back you're our very own father we're your very own children and your word is true we thank you for the covenant that we have with you we pull on it right now Jesus we come before you as our high priest our Lord and we ask you to take our tithe and our offering, and our seed to the Father, and worship Him on our behalf. Make His heart glad. Dance before Him. Have a good time, Lord. Have a good time with Him. We know that the seed and the tithe and the offering is going to be spent back on us and for the welfare and benefit of the kingdom and the people of the earth. We bless you, Lord Jesus. We praise you and give you all glory and honor. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I decree that the windows of heaven are open to us right now. Yes, hallelujah. And the blessing is being poured out in ways that we don't have room enough to receive because it's overflowing. In the name of Jesus, spiritually, soulishly, financially, physically, socially, favor in the name of Jesus, we claim tithers' rights. We decree right now that the devourer is rebuked for our sake in the name of Jesus. I thank you that that devourer is rebuked, that the seed eaters should not eat our harvest, that our harvest is coming into us now unhindered in the name of Jesus. Ministering angels, we release you to go bring our harvest and bring it to us now. Satan, we break your power in Jesus' name. We decree that as we've given, it's being given unto us with good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over men. The wealth of the wicked is given into our bosom, transferred to us. In Jesus' name, if you believe it, shout amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory be to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to God.